Hello, everyone. I'm Joy Zhou, tax partner from Mazda Beijing, a professional consulting firm. I'm very glad to be here sharing some tax experience with all of you. Firstly, I feel honored to be invited by the EU SME Center. The EU SME Center is a European Union initiative provides a comprehensive range of hands-on support services to European small and medium-sized enterprise, getting them ready to do business in China. The EU SME Center is managed by six implementing partners who through their knowledge and experience of the China market guide the strategic development and management of the center. Here we list down the main achievements. Over 140 market reports, guidelines and case studies you can download from website. Over 10,000 registered users. 316 engaged trade support partners in the EU and China. And also collaborating with external experts worldwide. The center co converts valuable knowledge and experience into practical business tools and services easily accessible online. The Pencham is the Benelux Chamber of Commerce, the most active business platform in China. Its member leading companies from Belgium, the Netherlands, and the Luxembourg share an active interest in developing trade and business in China. Benchem currently has more than 250 members, consists of large enterprise, SMEs, as well as individuals. Benchem networks help you making connections between members, organizations, and the government, and also sharing content and experience in doing business in China. This will enable you to arrange everything you need to optimize your business and operations in China. Let me introduce myself background. I am tax and business advisory service leader for Northern China region in Maza. I have been practicing tax and business consulting for over 14 years and have significant experience working with multinational companies dealing with inbound and outbound tax, including global mobility tax minimization, business model optimization tax-efficient restructuring for cross-border transaction, supply chain planning, tax-efficient repatriation, transfer pricing, and local country tax planning. Maza is an international integrated and independent organization specializing in audit, accounting, tax, and advisory service. Maza can call on the skills of one 18,000 professionals in 260 offices in 79 countries and across North America, Latin America, Europe, Asia Pacific, and Africa. Well, this is the agenda for my today presentation. My topics mainly cover the PRC tax implications regarding the payments to non-resident enterprise, as well as current practice regarding the foreign exchange administration in China. Firstly, I will elaborate the PRC tax implications regarding the payments to non-resident enterprise in detail, including the obligation, compliance requirement, and the possible issue. Let's look at the first part to know some basic definition. What is non-resident enterprise? The definition is an enterprise established within the territory of another country or other tax region, if whose effective management is located outside China, but which has an establishment or place in China, or even if if it does not have an establishment or place in China, but has income derived from China. To get the right taxation, we need to distinguish between the companies that have a permanent establishment and those that do not. For example, 
PLC sales and foreign sales income are taxable for a foreign company with an effective connected permanent establishment in China. But only PLC sales income is taxable for foreign companies with no establishment with no permanent establishment or one without an effective connection. In general, so foreign source income is not taxable in China. However, if the foreign source income is effective connected with the permanent establishment, then it will be taxable. If non-resident enterprise do not have a permanent establishment within China, only the PRC source income is subject to withholding tax. So I hope you are clear now which part of income will be taxed in China. Permanent establishment is a uh, the key concept to help you to justify the tax liability in China. Second, the PRC source income, it is very important to distinguish the income type and the source from. Different income type might lead to various tax liabilities. You should firstly distinguish the income type and nature then, to understand the corresponding tax implications for each income, we will give some examples in next slide. Okay, the third, duly withholding taxes before bank transfer. From practical perspective, as you may be aware, China has much strict foreign exchange control. And hence, the bank generally would require the remittance approval issued by the tax authority after the fulfillment of withholding tax obligations. In addition, based on our observation recently, although there is no express guidance or rule released from the bank or safe authorities, the bank sometimes would set man-made obstacles in the outbound transfer. So in conclusion, when making the payment out of China, it is important to consider the first tax implications in China, the second foreign exchange administration. Otherwise, you may pay more tax in China, which may not allowed to claim in your home country. And also, you will put more efforts to get approval from tax bureau and bank. Let's take a look at the obligation. The first question, who is liable for fulfilling the formalities? The taxpayer should be non-resident enterprise, foreign enterprise, who receive the PRC source income and they are liable for paying the relevant taxes to Chinese tax authority. The typical tax filing procedure here is the Chinese enterprise as the withholding agent should withhold the due taxes from the payment, remit the tax payment to competent tax authorities, and then remit the net payment to the foreign enterprise. Second question, we should understand what is the nature of income. Generally, passive income mainly includes dividend, capital gain, interest, royalty fee, rental fee, and so on. Well, the activity income mainly refer to service income in relation to some engineering projects, design, and other service. Last question, we will discuss what kind of tax should be withheld. Passive income such as dividend, interest, royalty, capital gain is subject to a tax rate of 10%. Certain tax treaty would provide more preferential tax rate. For example, if a recipient of interest is a resident of Hong Kong, the income tax rate could be reduced to 7%. Tax base is the total turnover that the foreign enterprise generates in, in China for the relevant projects. No expense related to this service can be deducted in this case. So, in addition, except for income tax, VAT and the local surcharge shall also apply for interest income, rental income, and royalty income. For active, in, active
negative income such as service income, generally only VAT and the local surcharge would apply if there is no permanent establishment constitute. Besides, stamp duty would apply in the case where equity transfer agreement or service contract is signed or used within the mainland China. Now we talk about PE, permanent establishment, related tax implications. This is a common case in most payments to foreign enterprise. If the PE is constituted, the general formula for calculating income tax will be contract price times applicable profit rate and then times applicable tax rate, for example, 25%. The profit rate range from the 15% to 50%, depending on the type of service provided. So according to the rules, the profit rate should be 15% to 30% for service such as design and consulting, and 30% to 50% for management service, and over 15% for other kind of service. In some cases, the tax rate will be lower than 10% if the service is related to construction and design. When justifying the, rate, the tax rate for permanent establishment, you need to clarify the service activity very clearly for easy judgment by tax authority. Okay, in, the, in this slide, we will focus on the main compliance requirements of China tax authority. The general procedure is registration of the withholding tax agent. Then the, chi the agent is a Chinese company who makes the payment. Okay, second, contract registration. So it should be done within 30 days after your sending of the contract. The third one, tax liability judgment. So this one will be also including the application of tax treaty relief. The second, then the next, withholding and remittance of tax and payment to the tax bureau. And then application of remittance approval. So after you get this approval, you will have a paper of the tax payment certificate. You can go to the bank to make the payment transfer. So when it comes to the tax liability judgment, Generally, the tax authorities would require lots of supporting documents for them to review and make the judgment of the tax liability. If the taxpayer wants to enjoy the tax treaty benefit, much more documents, including application forms, it should be sub submitted for approval. This is always a key and a time-consuming step for the whole formalities. In October 2017, ICT, a State of Administration Taxation, released a new regulation for withholding income tax for non-resident enterprise. This rule will be released uh, will be effective from December 2017. We call new circular 37. So in this circular, they will have several notable changes. The first change simplifying tax collection and administration procedures. For example, the withholding agent to perform contract registration when with its competent tax authority within 30 days from the date the contract is uh, signed. For this uh, 30 days, it's removed. It is not a mandatory step to register contract within 30 days of the contract signing. So please kindly note that this change is only applicable for the cases such as dividend repatriation, royalty, interest, and rental income. For other kind of contract, it also requires the contract registration as before. For example, service income, you also have to register. Okay, another key change, timing of withholding tax liability. For example, Dividend dispute to foreign shareholders, the withholding obligation for non-resident enterprise arise on the day the payment made rather than on the day of the resolution to declare the dividend. 
so the date will be much more postponed. Yeah. This new circular brings significant changes for non-resident enterprise to fulfill their China tax obligation. And also withholding tax agents perform their withholding obligation. These new changes will be welcomed by non-resident enterprise and relieve their compliance burden in China. So we strongly recommend you to review and arrange the relevant transactions and payment procedures according to these new released regulations so as to enjoy the benefits. So based on our observation recently, although the tax authorities to some extent mitigate the workload, such as simplifying the procedures of the Chinese enterprise, paying outbound items to overseas enterprise, the trend is they put more, much more focus on the applicability of tax treaty relief as well as the continuous post-stage supervision. So parties to any cross-border transactions should pay particular attention to these new changes. Now we look at a real study to better understand the tax implications. Before analyze this case, let's share some practical experience. In practice, whether an income is determined at the technical service fee or royalty will impose a significant impact on the tax liabilities for non-resident enterprise. As the definition of royalty involved in the trade of uh, technologies are much rich in China tax laws, as well as in the tax treaty signed by China. The Chinese tax authorities in practice tend to regard as a license rather than the service and thus require domestic enterprise to withhold and remit the withhold income tax for royalties accordingly. So now, uh, circular number 15, uh, 507 and circular number 75 as the latest regulations in a series of rules aimed at strengthening the administration of non-resident enterprise, claiming tax treaties benefits, provide clearer guidance on the applicability of articles on royalty in a tax treaty, which would be helpful for non-tax residents to more accurately assess the tax implications when deriving royalties from or provide related service to China. Okay, now let's see this case study. In this chart, you will see that company A and company B enter into the technical service contract, which under A, the service provider located in Sweden, provides a series of service to company B located in China. The main content of service is A will provide relevant technical support, including the providing research report reviewing the design plan of B and providing on-site assistance. Now, we can see some key clause in this agreement. Clause regarding conf confidentiality. So both parties agree that any written documents or oral information should be kept highly confidential over five years. Clause regarding limitation of use. One party without the prior written approval of another party cannot provide or disclose any contract clause, standard, engineering drawings, modeling, samples to any third party. And the last clause regarding ownership of IP right. The service provider remains the owner of the IP right. If any IP right is created during the project process. Now we like, let's see what challenge or concern from the competent tax authority. Okay, the first one. The Chinese company B had the complete ownership of the information provided by the party, the foreign party A. But company B 
has no authority to disclose such information. So we can refer to the clause of the limitation of use. Then the second, the Chinese company B is forbidden to apply for patent on the information work provided by foreign party A. So party A, they have the ownership of IP right. And the confidentiality clause cannot be cancelled. Then the last, the Chinese company B cannot transfer information work provided by foreign party A to the third parties. Okay, this is from the clause of limitation of use. So in practice, tax authority will always refer to this evidence in favor of their opinions. So for example, tax authority is very sensitive on some wordings. For example, design, software, technology. So in this case, if the agreement mentioned the wor works performed including design, drawings, and calculation models. So these results are protected by cop copyright law and can be included in the scope of royalties as defined in the tax treaty. The ownership of technology. This is always the key information the tax authority will pay attention. If does not mention the ultimate ownership in the agreement, the tax officer will always request you to provide such information on set when you submit the payment application. If service recipient, Chinese company in this case, has limitation to use this information, in such case, the tax authority will tend to regard this service income as royalty. So after several round negotiation between tax authority and the Chinese company B, so in this real case, finally Chinese company B accepted the view of tax authority regarding such service fee as royalty and the paid relevant income tax and VAT. So normally, royalty will be taxed at 6% of VAT and 10% of withholding tax. Well, for service, if no permanent establishment is constituted, no withholding tax would be imposed. It is important to justify the nature of the income when making the payment out of China. The tax withheld would be totally different. And also, if the classification is incorrect, the paid withholding tax might not be allowed to claim in your home country. So to avoid the dispute on judgment with tax authority, we always suggest company to review the agreements carefully and especially for those key items we just mentioned, ownership, limitation of use, and some sensitive wording. Okay, this is uh, the first topic about the uh, payment to non-resident enterprise. Okay, so next, we will talk about the second topic, the current practice regarding the foreign exchange administration in China. We will elaborate this topic mainly from the three aspects. So introduction, recent status, and forecast. For foreign invested enterprise looking to enter the China market, a thorough understanding of China's currency control is very crucial. Unlike most developed economic countries, China does not allow for unrestricted cross-border currency transfer or foreign currency conversion into renminbi. As you may be aware, the state administration of foreign exchange is the in-charge governmental authority responsible for regulating the foreign exchange matters and capital inflow and outflow management. Now we see the recent matters. In the past years, the China government has been actively encouraging Chinese businesses to expand globally 
by acquiring resources, the advanced technology, and the distribution channels overseas. We can see the chart of global FDI flow proportion. China becomes the number two in the world, just less than the United States. Then we see the FDI amounts in the past five years for China. The amounts increased significantly from year to year. Especially for 2016, the increase rate is significantly higher than past years. Following the relaxation of the outbound investment approval process in late 2014 and early 2015, China direct investment into the U.S. hit a record of $45.6 billion in 2016, nearly tripling the amount in 2015, including $36 billion invested by private investors. Despite this surge in the total value of deals in 2016, the total number of completed investment projects by Chinese investors decreased from 169 to 142. So 2016 saw a dramatic increase in the average deal value from the 19 million in 2015 to 320. 21 million in 2016. Total investment from the Chinese private companies in the United States also increased 200, 202% from 2015 to 2016. The strong growth of offshore investment did not come without risk. The sudden outflow of foreign currencies through about acquisitions put some pressure on China foreign currency reserve, which is closely monitored by the Chinese government with very eyes. Direct investment in offshore financial products is still tightly restricted, but the depreciation of the renminbi and a strong dollar created additional incentive for investors to use the relatively easy outbound strategy investment process as a way to securement the currency exchange control. Starting from the second half year of 2016, it has become clear that China, the Chinese government is prepared to tighten its rings on outbound investment. Many investors started to receive interview requests and the filing process to obtain foreign currency slowed down significantly. In a Q&A statement published in late November 2016, the National Development and Reform Commission, NDRC, and the Ministry of Commerce, MOFCOM, the State Administration of Foreign Exchange, SAFE, and the People's of Bank of China, PBOC, announced that the following types of offshore M&A transactions are subject to the additional government scrutiny. The first one, investment in certain sectors deemed speculative in nature, such as real estate, hotel, uh, entertainment, or sports club. Second, the major investment in business outside of the investor's core business scope. The, sec the third, elbow investment by limited partnership. So no most PE and VC funds are organized as a limited partnership in China. The next, investment by newly set up companies with recently received capital contributions. The last one, big overseas subsidiary or target with a much smaller parent company size. Various local government agencies have also implemented rules restricting capital outflow through overseas acquisition. Although MOFCOM and the NDRC at the national level have not implemented any formal rules imposing additional restrictions on foreign acquisition, the recent actions at local level indicate that 
all overseas acquisitions going forward must meet the following criteria to complete the registration and the currency exchange process. The Chinese investor must have operated for more than one year without a high debt equity ratio. This is supported by audited financial reports. The second, the target company's operation is closely related to the Chinese investor's core business, so including the upstream or downstream business. The, the third, the investment is strategic in nature. So PE, VC, and other investment companies will have a hard time to get money converted into foreign currency. The fourth, the transaction itself does not require significant leverage. So the last one, the equity interest to be acquired cannot be less than 10% if the target is a public company. So it is generally expected that the NDRC and MOFCOM would would promulgate formal, formal rules in the near future to provide legal support for case-by-case -case reviews of all bond investment transactions. The Chinese government's plan to stop all bond capital flight has also included increased scrutiny on exchange of the renminbi. Shortly after the joint statement was published, SAFE announced that any exchange of the renminbi in the amount over 5 million would be subject to additional review. In the past, the threshold is 50 million. Starting July 1, 2017, PBOC as the regulator of banks has also required all financial institutions in China to report any cash transactions over 50,000 renminbi, so a, a pro Approximately USD is a uh, seven point two thousand. Our uh, <coughs> uh, overseas transfers over two hundred million renminbi. Approximately USD twenty nine point five thousand. So all of those measures will make it more difficult for both individuals and companies to exchange renminbi into foreign currencies, regardless of the purpose of such exchange. In the past. Individual and companies did not face too much regulatory supervision and were generally allowed to purchase under uh, USD 50,000 in foreign currencies for trade purposes and certain personal use, such as tourism. So based on most analysts' observation, they believe that the current restrictions are temporary. They are merely aimed at preserving China's foreign currencies reserve and discouraging the speculative transactions without commercial subsidies in light of the current economic uncertainties. In the long run, those restrictions could either be modified or lifted when the foreign currency reserve in China or renminbi exchange rate stabilized. So, in short, it is very important to consider several aspects when doing business in China and pay sufficient attention to the tax implications in China and foreign exchange impact. When necessary, it is highly recommended to seek the opinion from the experts in order to avoid or mitigate any uncertainty and any unnecessary risk. China levies a wide range of taxes, including income taxes, turnover taxes, taxes on real estate, and also other taxes. In this evolving tax environment, companies face many challenges in meeting compliance obligations and mitigating tax risks. At Mazas, we could provide integrated tax solutions to help you always prepare in advance. Whatever the nature and the size of your business, our team of tax specialists have the local presence and the up-to-date regulatory knowledge to help you make the proper decisions to move your business going forward. Um, here we list down several websites for today's topic. 
Chinese outward foreign direct investment in the EU, drafting sales contracts when exporting to China, understanding non-resident enterprise taxation in China, payment options and foreign control in China. You can just browse this website for your information. Now it's Q&A section. If you have any questions to ask about this webinar, please register at this website or you just send email to this email address for you for any inquiry. Today's presentation is finished. So should you have any questions, you could also contact that email to the website and also contact expert from the EU SME Center, Ben Chum, and also Mazas for further consulting. Bye-bye, everyone.